Okay, today is December the 3rd, 2007. My name is Tanya Fitcham. I'm with Oklahoma State University Library, and we're doing an oral history project entitled Women of the Oklahoma Legislature, Past and Present. Great. And today I'm with Representative Lisa Billy, and she was elected in 2004. Yes. Okay. So thank you for having us today. Absolutely. Okay. Let's start by having you tell a little bit about your childhood, where you were born, and then we'll work our way forward. Okay. Well, I was born in Purcell, Oklahoma, and I was born in the old hospital. It's now uh, becoming a museum, so it kind of dates me. But I um, spent my early part there in Purcell and was actually spent most of my childhood in Bristow, Oklahoma, east of Bristow, on a farm. My father worked for Ogenny, so we were transferred and uh, spent my life uh, as a child uh, riding horses. My grandparents are from Purcell, so my grandfather was a cutting horse trainer. So spent a lot of time learning to hang on to his horses that he trained. He was very skilled, and uh, sitting on his horse, you had to hang on tight because it would follow any calf that moved in the arena. So uh, chased pigs and horses and dogs and cows and, and um, chickens and learned to haul hay, learned to drive a compound uh, hay truck at a very early age because, um, you know, if there wasn't anybody to drive, then it was my dad and brother and a couple of neighbors bringing in the hay bales. And uh, so I would help drive. And so that's how I spent my childhood, um, you know, running the creeks and picking up snakes and scaring my mom. And uh, just I, I had a really, really wonderful uh, time, I think, being with animals and learning to uh, work with animals' personalities, I think, was very beneficial to me as a child. And you had one brother then? I have one older brother, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And in high school, were you interested in politics? Or no. Or? No. Uh, I've never been interested in politics in high school. I'm, I'm probably an odd one uh, compared to a lot of my colleagues. In high school, I was very, I was an artist, so I was very involved with our art club, also our Native American Student Association, very involved in that. Uh, served as a cheerleader for a number of years and um, at that point we had moved to Medill High School and uh, I we had you know a farm so we had pecan trees so I spent a lot of time uh, shaking those pecan trees and loading up my barrel and um, doing things like that on the farm just the things that were necessary to keep it running and um, but I was never interested in politics as a as a high school student. I reluctantly, at my parents' urging, ran for a student council when I was a senior in high school. And uh, so I did run, and I was I felt like I was being pushed to do that uh, by my parents and a couple of my teachers. And so I reluctantly ran and I won. And I'm glad that I did that. I, it was a lot of fun serving with my friends. We were all graduating that year. So it was kind of neat having um, some leadership opportunities as a senior and looking at um, how we were going to do the prom and different, you know, the graduation ceremony and, and how that was all going to transpire. So that was a lot of fun. And then after, after high school, you went where to college? I did my undergraduate degree at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah. And I'm very thankful because I had an art teacher named Dan Baskin who uh, pushed me, pulled me, prodded me to put all of my artwork together in a portfolio of which he purchased the portfolio. He did all of my matting for my artwork. Uh, my family was not able um, to do that for me and so Dan Baskin did all of that for me and uh, he did it for all the students that he felt like had a real potential to pursue art in college and uh, because of his working and then my dad I remember we drove on campus and I went and actually applied in front of a committee for the art scholarship and I was selected as one of the recipients and so off I went to college and sold my artwork literally all the way to Tahlequah. I had uh, several relatives and friends um, via Oklahoma City and Moore and Mustang and on the way to Tahlequah and I, I had printed my artwork into stationary form. So I sold my artwork on the way to college so I would have money um, for gas and necessities and things and I had just sold a couple of my calves so and along with my art scholarship I had my tuition paid for the first year. So um, that began my career in college. And then after that did you work or did you go on to for a master's? Well I, I actually I did both and uh, again it was um, not something I had planned to do. Um, I was the, my brother and I 
almost graduated at the same time. I think I beat him by uh, maybe a month or two uh, from college. He had gone on to play professional football, so his his college career was put on hold for a little while, but my parents had not had the opportunity, nor my grandparents, um, to pursue college. And so it really was something new uh, for my family, and um, I really wasn't sure what I would do beyond uh, graduating. But while I was in college, I became very active with an organization that I founded along with several of my friends called Peacemakers. And uh, I had worked several odd jobs, as you can imagine when you're in college. Uh, worked as a waitress and babysat and uh, literally did anything I could do. I did work study on campus and I also worked in a Sequoia boarding school, which is uh, near Tahlequah. It's a boarding school for Native American students that uh, come from all over the United States. And through that opportunity, I realized a lot of Native kids were struggling with a lot of issues I had struggled with. And up in me rose this passion of how can I help them to get beyond high school and look at college and look at the rest of their destiny that I believe God has ordained for all of us. How, How can I help them get from there to the next step in their life? And so... Uh, literally as an accident, we formed an organization called Peacemakers Incorporated and began doing these motivational workshops on uh, campus and worked primarily at that time with Native American youth, um, high school students, and then we began working with younger students, and then we began working with all students, not just Native Americans, but we realized that we could we had something to offer all of them. So there was a group of us. There were about 15 of us peacemakers in the beginning. And so when I graduated from college, I had, my mother was a state employee and she wanted me desperately to apply for their um, fitness director because I had become a fitness instructor on campus. And she wanted me to become one of their activities fitness directors at one of the state lodges where she was employed. And I, I thought it would be a nice stable position and it would be money and, and I would enjoy it, but my heart was calling me to continue building peacemakers, which had no money <laughs> and um, no, truly there, there was not any road already paved, but I took the hard road, which is kind of typical sometimes of me, and uh, I began doing peacemakers as a full-time job and uh, actually did that up until I married and, and had children. So somewhere along the way, people started paying me to do that, and and we actually became an incorporation, a business, and and uh, it was just a wonderful opportunity because I worked with young people from, you know, all across the United States and into Canada, and and uh, of course lots of work in Oklahoma, as well. So, um, but during that time, I met a professor that really encouraged me, and I met a man who was Secretary of Transportation at the time named Neil McCaleb. And Neil and his wife became great friends of mine. Neil's a Chickasaw Indian, as I am Chickasaw, and they encouraged me. So I began my master's degree at OU. Had never planned to do a master's. In fact, um, when I graduated from Northeastern, I planned to never, ever go back into a classroom, as probably a lot of uh, young people do. Um, My trips to the library was when I had an art showing at the library. I wasn't wasn't very studious at that time. I was more into uh, doing human relations and art and things of that nature. Um, very involved on campus. I did get involved in student senate, again at the urging of someone else. It, it, it had not been my plans or desires, but uh, the president at the time of Northeastern was Roger Webb. And uh, Ro- Roger obviously saw some potential in me. I'm not sure how deep he had to dig, but he got me involved in student senate, so I ran and was elected, and um, and then so at the University of Oklahoma, I became very involved in campus activities, and ran my business from my little storefront shop in Purcell, Oklahoma, and and I had a little art studio there, and did my masters and traveled all over working with uh, young people and doing motivational organizational development. Didn't know it was called all of that at the time though. <laughs> I really didn't didn't understand all of that until I finished my master's degree. I had several professors that helped me. I needed a lot of help, um, but Dr. Beverly Fletcher was another amazing woman who uh, channeled me and guided me, and and uh, she basically defined for me the work that I was doing with young people. So that's what I did. And is that still in operation? No, I um, quit doing that. Uh, I met my husband through Peacemakers. 
And so he and I together did the work, uh, working with Native youth, and, and um, it was just an incredible opportunity. Plan to continue doing that, but when we had our first child, uh, we had been married, I guess, about three years, and I had not wanted my own children because I felt like I had a huge number of kids that were always at my house and just didn't feel like my own children that, that would just take up more space at the time. That was my thinking. But um, we um, got pregnant with our first son. We now have three children, and uh, they're just the love of my life. But um, after I had my first child, I didn't know that I would change my um, desires, but my desires definitely changed. Uh, I did a quick turnaround and decided to stay home with my first baby, and so that's what I did. And then when, when did all the interest in the politics actually? Well, let's see. Out, actually? Probably my um, first child was about two years old, and there was a uh, position at the Chickasaw Nation. I'm Chickasaw, and my father was currently serving on the Chickasaw Legislature. He was serving as a Chickasaw legislator, and my dad called me, and he said, you know, you've had such a passion for youth and, and doing things for family. He said, why don't you run? For, while you're a stay-at-home mom, you'll have the time. It'll probably be the only time in your life that you can do this. And uh, he said, why don't you run and get some of the ideas of the younger generation on the, the Chickasaw legislature? And I thought, hmm, okay. I never thought about doing that, but... It sounded very um, reasonable to me. I had the time, I could take my baby with me, and uh, the, the ability and opportunity to do something for the next generation of young people was very exciting to me. Mm -hmm. So I ran, and I won, and uh, served, and then had my second child, and decided I would just serve again. So I served six years on the Chickasaw Tribal Legislature, and then I had my third child, and decided I did not want any more politics. I just, uh, I was a scout leader and kind of typical. I, you know, become a scout leader, very active at my church as a Sunday school teacher and teaching children's ministry. And so from there, I decided to really just stay at home. And uh, what happened is I have a very good friend who's passed on now, but she's a former state senator and her name's Helen Cole. Helen Cole changed my destiny. And I believe that she was used mightily to do that because I was um, very stubborn in not wanting to go back into politics. And uh, she called me one fall afternoon. Um, she said, Lisa, I have a question for you. And Helen would often call me. I would help her with little odds and ends maybe if she needed a ride somewhere, if she wanted me to pick up something at the store and drop off to her. Um, and so I just assumed it was something along that nature. And I said, sure, what can I do for you? And I was sitting there with my new baby, about a year old now at this point, and she said, I want you to run for the House of Representatives. And I, I literally laughed. I was drinking a cup of coffee, and I was like, I don't think so. And I, but I didn't say that out loud because you don't say those things to Helen Cole. And uh, she said, now before you answer me, I, I know that you tell me you're a woman of faith, so I would assume you'll pray about the matter. <laughs> so, you know, what do you say at that point? And I, and I said, um, oh, oh, yes, ma'am, I, I will pray. So I hung the phone up and I thought, well, I don't hear any booming thunder from the Lord to tell me to do this, so I don't think so. And I, I didn't give it another thought. And she called me three days later, almost to the exact time. And she said, Lisa, Helen, what did the Lord tell you? And I said, uh, Miss Helen, I, I haven't heard anything. So I'm kind of thinking that's a no. She said, I believe you're wrong. And I believe you are supposed to run for the House of Representatives. And I laughed and I said, Helen, first of all, a woman's never been elected in my house district. My political party has never been elected in my house district. And a Native American has not been elected. And I said, Helen, in case you know, I don't come from a family of wealth or political prestige. I don't have anybody in my family or my husband's family that could even offer any type of advice in this arena. And she said, I believe you're supposed to run, and I, I am going to make sure that happens. And, and a few months after that, Helen had a, a stroke, and uh, she ended up passing on. The time that she spent in her hospital bed, she spent making a lot of telephone calls, and she was literally paralyzed on one side of her body, but that did not stop her in her 80s 
from making phone calls to people who would then call me and encourage me to run for the House of Representatives. And uh, I, I felt that sense of obligation. Um, here's a woman who really believes in me, who overcame those obstacles herself when she first ran. Um, she was a bank teller when she first ran, and I thought, how can I tell her no? And uh, so I really felt that strong obligation, especially seeing her in the hospital continuing to work. No excuses that, you know, that just kept coming back to my mind. No excuses. And so I made the decision. And I remember when I went in to visit with her and I said, Helen, I've made the decision. I'm going to run. She said, good. I'm glad. And, um, of course, she passed on just a few weeks after I had finally told her. And I'm glad that I did tell her before she passed on. Well, how had you met her to start with? Well, Helen is Chickasaw, and I'm Chickasaw, and being a former Chickasaw legislator, or when I was a legislator, she and I had met at different events. And, uh, in fact, I'm the chair I was the chairman of a committee that helped set up our the bank for Chickasaw Nation, and we were in the process of interviewing bank board members. And her son, Tom Cole, was one of the folks that we interviewed. And so I remember, um, I, of course, I already knew Helen at that point, but kind of made those connections. Um, but we had met just at tribal uh, functions and events. Well, I'll tell a little bit about your campaign then. Well, the campaign was definitely a shoestring campaign. And um, it was uh, it was a door to door uh, campaign. That was the only probably the only asset I had. Uh, Helen told me she said if you don't wear out a good pair of tennis shoes, you didn't knock enough doors. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was the one thing I had. I could knock doors, and uh, I I could jog from house to house, and literally I would jog from house to house. Got chased by a lot of dogs, so <laughs> outran all of them except the one Chihuahua. Uh, that one got me on the back of the hills, but um, that's how we ran our campaign. Uh, on most days, it was myself driving, but I tried to work out uh, two or three days a week. I campaigned six days a week, never campaigned on Sunday, but I always tried to make sure that there was a friend or my mom would come down. My mom helped take care of my children, so she really couldn't help me campaign a lot but uh, and my husband was working five jobs to help pay for the campaign and then he was also my number one sign man so um, he was pretty filled up doing things but I would try to get a few of my friends that uh, would drive me because it made it go a lot quicker I could get more done if someone was driving me that way I could just jump out at each house run lock the door come back jump in the car and we could we could go down the road but that's literally how we ran it. I would pack a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a bologna sandwich in the mornings. And a, if I had a bag of chips or a pickle and something to tide me over for the afternoon. And uh, whoever drove me, I would always say, I've got a PB&J or bologna. Which do you prefer? And uh, that's how we ran it. And then election day, what was that like? Well, um, election day was very nerve-wracking. I just remember waking up going, oh, I just want to get this over with. I just want to get it over with as soon as possible. And my mother had been preparing for several days to have a watch party. And so she had been cooking. She's a wonderful cook, and she had prepared all kinds of wonderful food. And so that evening we had a little place in Purcell where we set all the food up. And I just you know, it was so nervous. I, I just, you know, that's the part about campaigning that I don't like to revisit it, the campaign day, the actual voting day. It's, um, it's very nerve wracking, but I began that day at about 6:30 that morning. A friend came down. I had people located all across my house district and we did something uh, a bit unusual, but I was an unusual candidate. So I had to do things a little unusual, but we did sign waving and a lot of people laughed at us but we were on the corners in the different parts of my district so i did that all day long i went from one part of the district to another part to another part to another part so by seven o'clock i was worn out mm -hmm. and uh, from doing all the sign waving but i had a lot of people that helped me so there were billy waving signs all across my house district so at seven i made sure that myself and several of other friends who weren't sign waving that we had gone out and provided hot cocoa and candy bars to the to the teenagers and, and coffee to the adults that had been outside waving. It was very cold 
on that day in November. So we made sure that they were all invited to come eat at the watch party. So they had a, their bellies filled and warm coffee or warm tea. And um, then we received the call probably around 9.30 and it had started pouring down rain. And um, <clears throat> they told me that, that I had won. And I said, I don't think all the precincts are counted yet. I, I still didn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that I had won. And uh, they said, most of the precincts are in, more than 50% of the precincts are in, and uh, you, you've won. And, and I just remember thinking this, this overwhelming, and they said, you need to come to Oklahoma City. And I remember thinking, I just want to go to bed. I'm so tired. I don't want to go to Oklahoma City. But um, a good friend of mine who's, um, I lost my mother about 14 months ago, and a good friend of mine who's like a mom to me, she said, you get in my car, I'm driving you up there. We're going. And so we, we drove to Oklahoma City and celebrated with Congressman Tom Cole and and uh, all the other new House members. And, and then we got home after midnight, and uh, my mother and I stayed up till about 3. All the kids were in bed. And she had spent the night with me. And uh, my husband was out of state working one of his uh, five jobs to help pay for the campaign, bless his heart. And uh, my mom and I stayed up on the couch till about 3, um, just talking, you know back and forth and um, just the excitement and um, just hardly believing what had happened um, because of uh, the poverty that my family has um, overcome. Um, my little grandmother chopped cotton, picked cotton, drug her babies through the cotton fields and, and when the cotton season ended in Oklahoma she had moved to West Texas and she would chop and pick and uh, whatever new babies she would tie them on her cotton sack and drag them through the cotton fields. And uh, so um, it was really a great moment when, when I won. I felt like I'd won for my family. And um, so that's how that's how it happened. And then swearing in day. Swearing in day. Did they all show up? Um, we, we only were allowed actually one ticket um, to get in because it was so crowded in the gallery on that particular day. And so I was able to finagle around. There were a lot of house members that had been sworn in before. It wasn't that big of a deal to them. So I was able to get several other tickets. So my children, um, my mother, and my husband could be there on that day. That was my first time to ever be on the house floor. Um, I'd never, a lot of my colleagues served as a page um, or had done an internship um, or had an uncle who worked here or a um, grandfather. Never had any of that. Uh, living in rural Oklahoma on a farm, I'd never been to the state capitol. I'd never toured until after I was elected. And it was very overwhelming for me That's being right. sworn in. Did you come down Lincoln Boulevard that day? I did. I did. And I looked at the capitol and I just felt this overwhelming sense of opportunity and duty. Mm -hmm. I have a huge responsibility. 35,000 bosses live in House District 42, and they're all my bosses. And uh, I, I remember I just stopped and I prayed, and, and uh, I, I knew nothing. And so I asked the one who knows everything to help me, to give me wisdom. And, um, that's, I, and I still do that. I still, when I drive down Lincoln Boulevard, I look at the big capital and I think, oh my gosh, I work there. I've got a big job. I'm going to make sure I'm doing it right so that when the next woman chooses to run for this house district, people will say, well, you know, Billy, she did pretty good. I liked another woman. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to me that when I leave office, that I leave it perhaps better than I found it, but that I follow in the footsteps of the person who was here before me, but that the person who comes along, I leave some type of a model so that he or she can also leave it better than they found it. Do you remember the first day you debated a bill then? <laughs> oh my gosh, yes I do. I was scared as a cat in a doghouse. It, it was very nerve-wracking. Um, the only speech class I've ever had was at Northeastern State University and it was just your, your basic speech class. We didn't debate. It was just learning how to stand up and present. Um, an argument or an opposing view or sometimes the same view as the class. So I'd never had that experience and um, it was quite overwhelming for me. My hand was shaking so bad. I, 
I was holding my microphone and I kept switching my microphone and, and I would try to hold my arms so that it wasn't apparent <laughs> that I was shaking in my shoes. Uh, my knees were knocking. It was very overwhelming for me. Did it go well though? Did you win? Or... It did. It passed. It did pass and uh, it, it actually became law, that particular piece of legislation. And what was it? You can tell. It, it was um, a pro-life piece of legislation. It empowers women when they're um, pregnant and perhaps didn't mean to be pregnant. It gives them all the information about their unborn child. Um, it certainly doesn't take their right away if they still choose to terminate the pregnancy, but it does let them know what's inside of them. It provides an opportunity to have a free ultrasound if they so choose. Um, it also provides a waiting period of three days. I figure if you can go in to refinance your mortgage and you do have to wait to do that, then perhaps women need to have an opportunity to review the information of, of a living child that's inside of them. And uh, th the other piece, there are actually four parts to that, but one of the important pieces to me, besides the information aspect, was that if a woman is murdered when she is pregnant, that person will be um, tried for two deaths mm -hmm. so that we've actually recognized an unborn child as a living being mm -hmm. and um, that's very important to me so it it did it still had several processes to go through but it did become law are there any other ones you want to talk a little bit about um yes actually uh, there was a an idea that came from i have three children my husband and i have two boys and a girl and my oldest son when he was 10 he's now 13 but when he was 10 we were driving down i-35 in Oklahoma City and uh, there were pictures of um, billboards that contained uh, pornography um, advertising uh, various clubs that you could go to view these women and uh, I, I felt very vulnerable as a woman especially if I was on a business luncheon and I had to view these with other men in my vehicle. It's very embarrassing um, at least for me but it was my young boy who said mom I don't think women should be allowed to be portrayed that way. Why don't you do something about it? And I looked at him and I said, Mashili, I can't do anything about that. That's, that's too big. That's bigger than me. And he said, well, someday, Mom, if you're ever in a position to do something about it, you should. And then, of course, later on, I was elected, which I wasn't planning at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I won. And I remember he came back to me and he said, Mom, you remember we said if you ever became in a position of influence what you would do. Of course, he was a Cub Scout. He had just earned his We Below's badge and was working on his Arrow of Light. And so he was very, you know, duty and responsibility and making our community better, all very important to him. And I said, yes, I remember that. And um, it was my second legislative session that I decided to do something about it. And so I actually patterned the bill from Missouri and Massachusetts already had on their books um, laws that prevented pornography from being displayed and, and it was very descriptive in the law how how we define pornography and so I took those actual um, bills and we rewrote them I worked with uh, an attorney here in the house staff and it failed in committee the first time I had everyone stand up and say you're taking my you know First Amendment free speech you're attacking my rights and um, so we worked on it it affectionately became known as the Billy Billboard Bill. And then after we reworked it and reworked it, then it became the bigger and better Billy Billboard Bill. There was lots of um, teasing, as you can imagine, that went on um, when I would present the bill in committee. Sometimes embarrassing, um, but I had to keep my focus of how to make our highways family friendly and not embarrassing for women, especially for my daughter. And so it did become law, but it, it was held up. It was, um, there were some groups that claimed it was unconstitutional, and it was a very long process before it all happened, but it did finally happen. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy about that, and I'm very thankful that I had enough of my colleagues who also shared my vision to help me to make that happen. If you hadn't been reelected, would there have been someone to carry it on? I mean, you had a second. I, I did. I actually didn't draw an opponent in my okay. election. And um, so I was automatically reelected. And I'm very glad that I was there to help make sure mm -hmm. 
that it that it went through. I don't know if it would have had I drawn an opponent at that time. Any other bills? Um, there are several other bills. I think those are probably um, the most passionate to me. Um, we've done several other um, issues that I think are important, but um, my, my passion and my heart really rises up when it's issues that impact families and children and um, making things safer for Oklahomans. Do you have a role model what you got here? How I think um, I, I really I didn't know anybody that was here. Um, Helen Cole had certainly um, been my role model, and, and I, I grieved for her. I wish that she was here. There were many times I wanted to pick the phone up and, and say, Helen, I need help. <laughs> what do I do now? Um, there, there really wasn't. I've developed very close relationships with several other women that are elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're often um, given different titles, you know, the band of women, the three musketeers. Um, but I definitely have found my role models since I came here now. Representative Lee Denny, she, she's my role model. That's, that's who I wish to become when I get older. <laughs> yeah, that's who I want to be when I grow up, as they say. Um, she is a strong and courageous woman and not afraid to stand up for what she believes in. And, and she's a great mom. Um, she and I both stayed home when our children were little, and of course her children are off now, and it's great to see, you know, the the work of her hands. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she's who I want to be. Well, do you live here in town, or do you commute back and forth? Oh, I commute. Station? I commute. Um, it's about an hour drive, uh, depending on the flow of traffic, but I do commute. My husband and I have three children, and it, it's very important for me to make sure I have breakfast on the table. Um, my mother did that growing up. We had biscuits and gravy and sausage and pancakes and hash browns. And I don't do all of that at the same time. Um, but I always pick, if we have hash browns, we'll have eggs. Um, but I, that's very important for me. I want to make sure my children are well fed and, and um, their, their clothes at least semi-match. Um, mm -hmm. When my husband's in charge, they mm -hmm. don't always match. But at least he can get them seasonal. If it's cold, he'll dress them warm. So... That's the main thing, but um, I have lots of events in my district um, as well in the evenings. I, during session, it is challenging because we're about 14 hours a day working on legislation, so I don't always get to attend the events. My husband and children are usually out and about and attending. We're, Philip and I are both very active in the community, but um, sometimes I'll come in at midnight exhausted, and the, when that alarm clock goes off the next day, I definitely feel it, but it's worth it. So a typical day you would get here about <clears throat> what time? Well, during session. During session, I normally pull in around eight fifteen. Um, I drop my children off at school around seven thirty, and uh, depending on the drive, I'll I'll get here um, eight fifteen, eight thirty in the morning. And from the time I drop my children off till I arrive here at the Capitol, again, if there were no wrecks on the road, um, I'm I'm generally already on the phone and talking to other house members about what committee work, what bills coming up in committee, and how can we make this flow, and, and, um, and then we begin. I, um, you know, we run literally from meeting to meeting to meeting. I visit with constituents um, pretty much every day, either on the phone, email, or they'll come to my office. Uh, I'm always available. Those are the people who put me here, mm -hmm. and I feel like they're most important. My second job is to make sure I do what they need me to do. So I have to be at committee meetings. I need to be on the House floor. Uh, I don't miss work. Um, my, my father and mother definitely had a strong work ethic, and I'm very thankful. I uh, wasn't always thankful as a child. Um, there were Saturday mornings I didn't want to get up and go break the ice. Uh, I had a big brother who did most of the hard labor around the farm, but uh, my parents, I, I saw them work. Um, I saw my dad who had fallen off an electrical pole. He was an electrician. Um, who still got up and went, you know, bandages on his face. Um, my mom went to work every day, whether she felt good, whether she was running a fever. Um, when you run a farm, you have to take care of the animals regardless. And so I really appreciate that strong work ethic. Um, there's some days I would rather stay in bed and just drink coffee, but I can't do that. Um, there'll be a time for that, but it's not now. Well, what committees are you a member of? And chair, chair. Well, I chair a new committee. Um, the Speaker of the House uh, created a committee called the International Tribal State Relations Committee. 
when I was elected, uh, one of my goals was to form better relationships with the tribes in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, the tribes in Oklahoma formed the infrastructure of our great state, and I've, I've always sensed that tribes have been left out of the process, mm -hmm. um, negotiations, sitting at the table. And so uh, I was able to form, along with a couple of my colleagues, the Native American Caucus. And so what Speaker Cargill did when he was elected Speaker is he came along and he said, let's, I want to keep the Native American Caucus, and I want to keep everything you're doing, but I want to make it a little more official so we can have a committee that we can actually run legislation through. So he created the International Tribal State Relations Committee. So I chair that one. I serve on transportation, living in rural Oklahoma, um, highways, bridges, very important. Um, in particular, when um, we're running tractors, there's no shoulders on the road or moving hay from one pasture to another. Mm -hmm. Very important that we get those shoulders on our roads. So um, transportation is something I serve on. I also serve on the Human Services Committee and, of course, families and children, another passion of mine. What has your, been your biggest hurdle? Oh gosh, I think I have, I've had a lot. Um, catch up learning. Mm -hmm. A lot of my colleagues um, have a lot more experience than I do. So I feel like I've been in um, House of Representatives, maybe not even 101, just <laughs> like your prep class to the House or prep class to class 101. Mm -hmm. um, I really have felt like I've needed to catch up. Um, just even understanding the process of how committees work, of how we run bills, of how the Senate works, of um, how we work with House staff. I, I really, I wish I would have learned more. I wish I would have been more active in college, but I wasn't. Um, I was very active in other organizations, and those have played a key role um, in my life, in particular with the Native American Caucus. So I know tribal members and now leaders all across the state in nearly every tribe because of my previous activities. So those have come to play, but I think playing catch up, I think being a woman, um, many times, um, if, if we're assertive or, or we really work hard and we wanna get things done, sometimes um, we maybe have certain names or titles <laughs> stuck to us. Um, if a woman is very assertive, I think sometimes that's a challenge and we have to work to overcome it. Um, certainly, I did have people in the campaign who who just would not vote for me because I'm Chickasaw Indian. And um, that was that hurt sometimes. And so I would always say, well, I'm half Irish too. I'm not sure they believe me, but I would always try to say, well, I'm Irish. And, um, and certainly my, my political party um, in my house district, I've had to work very hard um, to let people know that I'm a person and I'm gonna vote what my district wants um, this is my political party, but here's what my district wants. And so I think, I, at least I hope, my prayers is that I've proven myself mm -hmm. and that my, my um, district realizes um, that I'm a hard worker, whether I'm a female, whether I'm Indian, whether um, my political party. So I've worked um, very hard. But the assets of being a woman are great. Um, we're much more detailed oriented. Um, I, I try to um, call people on their birthday. I don't get to do that every day, but I actually go through my voters list and I call people. And 99% um, of the time, and sometimes 100% of the calls I make, people really appreciate that. Um, I think women, because we are detail oriented, we can remember when I see people at the grocery store and in my district, I remember their daughter had, had you know, one, uh, one of the relay races last week. How's your daughter that was so great that she won that I saw her run, you know, she's really fast. Or how's your son doing? He's first year of college. What's going on with him? What's, what sports has he played? Um, I think women have that ability because we can move from the right side to the left side of our brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I see it as a real asset. But one thing my mother always taught me is whatever people see as a detriment in you, as a negative, as a, as a deficit, you are responsible for turning that into a positive. And you're the only one that can do it. You can either believe that, oh, well, I'm not smart, or I'm not an attorney, or I'm a woman. You can believe that, or you can say, yes, I am a woman. No, I'm not an attorney, but I can read. And so uh, lots of reading involved. But um, definitely, I think any, any negatives can be turned into a positive. Um, we might have to work a little harder, but that's okay.
Well, while we're on the subject of women, what advice would you give to someone that was thinking about running? Oh, I would say do it. I would say do it. Um, just like Helen Cole told me, just do it, Lisa. You can run this race. You can win. Don't give me any more excuses. Um, I think we need more women in politics. I think women bring a wonderful balance. I think women bring a personal perspective of what it's like when we talk about children and families. Who better than the wife? Who better than a female? To bring those perspectives forward. Not to say that men can't do it. I have a wonderful husband. But women can bring so much to the table. When we can manage, um, I remember one time I was in the dollar store buying candy to throw out at a football game. All three of my children had a major breakdown at the same time. I want this, I want that, no she gets this, no you give that to me, he took that away from me. And we all had our campaign t-shirts on. And I thought, oh great, if we only just didn't have campaign shirts on, nobody would know who I was. And everybody stopped and looked at me like, mm, I wonder how she'll handle those kids of hers. And I looked around and I remember thinking, you know, if I can handle my children's selfishness, not telling the truth, always wanting it my way, don't want to be a team player, I think I'm ready for the House of Representatives. Um, women bring that experience with them everywhere they go. So I would encourage every woman to get involved. Um, maybe it's not in the House of Representatives. Maybe it's on the local school board council. Maybe it's in the city council. Um, in Purcell, we have the second woman, uh, Mayor Betty Gerhard, serving as the mayor of Purcell. Only the second woman in Purcell's history. Mm. And uh, she's definitely setting a wonderful road that others can follow. So I would say, go for it. And about juggling family life, though, with the whole... It's a challenge. It, it is a challenge. Um, of course, my mother has passed on now. Um, she was a huge help to me. She um, lives an hour away from me, but she would drive down and um, she helped me incredibly. Um, it, it is a challenge that that part, you know, there's just there's just no denying. And uh, there are things you know, for me personally that I've had to um, let go of. I can't tell you who Hollywood actors are right now. I have no idea what movies are popular. I don't watch um, any of the, the current television shows. Um, when we do watch television, we, we watch Andy Griffith anyway, so, you know. Um, but I've had to, had to give up a few things. I don't have, um, I really don't have any hobbies, I guess you would say. But I really enjoy my life. And, um, you know, I've always wanted to put my photo albums together with my children. I don't have time to do that. So I have them in a box. Someday I'll put all that together. But you definitely have, you have to give up some things. But I figure whatever television shows are on now, if they're really good, yeah. I can watch them. I watch Andy Griffith reruns. So I figure 20 years from now I'll watch all the reruns of what was popular in 2007. Um, and so it's okay. Um, but you do have to give up. My house is not as clean as I wish it was. That's that's the other part. And I do like a clean house, but I can't do it. Um, but the, the real positive thing is my children and my husband have learned to do more. They didn't know they could do. Um, my daughter, who's now six, just turned six, she can do a whole lot. And she didn't know she could do that much. So I have to bring in the troops and get all the help that I can um, the kids know when mom comes home, I like things clean <laughs> and they do a really good job, um, and, you know, for children. Mm -hmm. But, um, so that's the good side of it is they do more now than they used to. And they cook? <laughs> um, you know, I did get, they're not great at cooking. Now they can open up blue bag, blue box macaroni, but, um, I don't <laughs> often buy that because I'm more of a, I, I prefer homemade things. I like, if we're going to make biscuits, pull out the flour. It's just cheaper, you know? Um, but I did put my son in charge of mashed potatoes a couple of weeks ago. I thought it would be a simple, I'd already cooked the chicken, here's the mashed potatoes, I'm running to a meeting, I'll be right back, your dad will be home soon. He totally scorched the mashed potatoes, ruined the pan, had to throw the pan away. He said, Mom, I can clean it. I said, I don't think so. But, you know, it's just one. It's okay. <laughs> it didn't burn the house down. It didn't burn the house down. Um, he's a good kid. So um, they do know how to make toast and, and grilled cheese sandwiches, and they can open a can of tomato soup. So I figure that's pretty good. At that young age, do you think they're in, interested in politics themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, politics sometimes can be so demanding and challenging that 
I don't know that I really encourage my children um, to go into politics, but interesting enough, uh, my oldest son, who's now 13, uh, attended a fall retreat with the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, there were probably 300 uh, teenagers and people that attended, and he ran for the Chickasaw Youth Council. And um, I didn't encourage him, and I didn't know he was going to do it. But when he came home, um, there I think there are 14 that were ultimately elected. But he said, Mom, he said, I didn't plan to run, but he said just something in me said, I've got to make a difference. And, and then my husband looked at me, and he said, I wonder where he's heard that from. <laughs> so I thought, oh, great. But, you know, I, I don't want to encourage him, but yet I do want to encourage him. I can't help but encourage them. Um, to be involved, maybe not politically, but to be involved actively as a community town member. So um, we'll see what happens with that. What happens after you finish your 12 years? Back oh, to art? <laughs> um, maybe um, sleeping for a few nights. I, I don't know. I've really not. Um, I, I, I probably should be more visionary. Um, I can serve eight more years, but... I, um, right now, my main goal is to raise my children, um, get them off, and, and give them a strong foundation of whatever they want to become in life. Um, serving my house district, you know, um, trying to be the best wife I can be. I don't know what I'll do after 12 years. I, I literally may just ride my horse around my pasture and enjoy the sunsets. Put your photo albums I may put my photo albums together. That's right. Yeah. Did you have, when you were campaigning, did you have a slogan? Um, I don't know that I really had a slogan. Uh, I probably should have, now that I think about it. Most of my campaign, my husband, I'm very fortunate, he's a very good writer. I'm not a very good writer, but I can tell him what I believe or what I'd like to see happen, and then he can put it on paper. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember one line that said, um, Tougher than you think works harder than you believe. And I remember I liked that line and uh, because a lot of people did only see me, oh, you're the mom, oh, you're a housewife. Because that's what I really was doing. I was a housewife. I taught a few classes at OU, um, two or three a year in the Department of Continuing Ed, but certainly didn't work full time outside my home at that point when I ran. So I think a lot of people, um, because of my profession of being a homemaker, I did have to work an extra step. Um, perhaps a woman who was already employed outside the home, she may not have had to work that hard, but I think a lot of people saw me as, oh yeah, she's the mom, we see her at the park swinging her kids. And, and so I think that my husband helped put that together. Tougher than you think, works harder than you can imagine. I think he probably did that to let people know, yes, she pushes children and changes diapers, but she's tougher than you think. So I guess that, that did carry on a few of them. So maybe that was it. And you have colors? Did you have colors for your signs? Um, on our campaign signs, we used blue. I really wanted to use um, burgundy because that's my favorite color, or red. And I had several people say that's just too feminine. And um, I went, okay. My husband said, honey, I really think blue will be great. So we went with blue. And, uh, it, and it's good. Blue's good. I just red and burgundy and maybe some lavenders in there. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody, all my volunteer team, and these are not political pundits, these are just normal folks like myself, and, and they're like, I don't think so. I don't, I'm like, can't you see like a lavender with a burgundy outline? They go, no, we can't see that. So I gave in and, and uh, all the campaign signs were blue. Did you have a consultant or you just figured it out yourself? It, it, no, I, I couldn't figure any of this out by myself. Um, Helen Cole was actually my beginning consultant, and uh, I'm very grateful. I, I don't think I even realized then what she was doing for me. Mm -hmm. When she would tell me, Lisa, you have to knock 100 doors a day. Lisa, you have to be on the phone with people. Lisa, you must do this. You must have large campaign signs so everybody can see them. You have to strategically locate them. Well, that's a great campaign strategy. I just didn't realize it um, at the time. But before Helen passed away, she had several people she wanted me to contact, people who had lots of political experience. And so I ended up, um, I did that. For me, it was very beneficial because they had years of experience that they could help me with. 
the good side is that my husband's a good writer, and so he could do all of my writing for me. So that saved us money. Um, but it also came from my heart mm -hmm. and not from maybe a person um, sitting in Tulsa or Oklahoma City. So, um, yeah, we, we did. In a way, we did. But eventually we did have a full-time consultant that, you know, would help me. So I'm very grateful that I did that because I knew nothing about the campaign. Well, do you, you speak Chickasaw? Well, uh, I speak Chickasaw and Choctaw, but I'm not fluent in the language. But I, I speak... Okay, uh, maybe depending on who you let ask, um, ask one of our elders and they'll encourage me and say she's doing good, but she has a long way to go. Um, ask my children and they think we all just speak all the time, but that, that was our first language for our children at home. And I'm very fortunate my husband grew up speaking Choctaw, and so um, that has been a great help. But um, yeah, we, we speak. Do you want to say one or something? Mm -hmm. And that's a little heavy on have to help translate it yeah, I'll, I'll translate it. Um, <laughs> just say, no, 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 not at all. I would say, um, halito achukma, which is, um, halito is more the Choctaw way of saying hello. Halito achukma achukma, how are you? Or if I was speaking to a Chickasaw, I would probably say achukma ta, which is another greeting. And uh, I love to start whenever I'm speaking somewhere, I really love to say, achukma. And that just means this is a great day. And when I say that, it is a great day, but there's much more behind just saying it's a great day. And if I say it in English, it's just not as meaningful for me. It's a great day. Okay, great. Um, when I say, or it is a wonderful day. It was a wonderful day in Oklahoma when I could win this election, when someone like myself can run for politics and actually win. Um, when someone like myself, who I've lived in poverty, I've lived in middle class, I prefer middle class, I don't like poverty, but I know how to survive in poverty. When a Native American can run in Oklahoma and win, it is a great day. Well, my last question then is if when history is written about you, what would you like for it to say? Oh, I am. Um, I guess I would like for it to say she was a great mom and she was a great cook that's what i'd like for it to say great cook why do we cook that's great do you have well, a, favorite, a favorite recipe um i make great indian tacos and enchiladas and biscuits and i i love to make chocolate gravy my grandmother always mm -hmm. made chocolate gravy and uh, my mom taught me of course, I can make white gravy too, but I love chocolate gravy. And when I make gravies, whether it's brown gravy or white gravy or whatever, it's symbolic to me too because my grandmother made gravies as a lot of people did in Oklahoma mm -hmm. because it was a filler. Mm -hmm. um, it was cheap. Mm -hmm. And so my kids love my gravy. And uh, last night I made a great deer soup. Um, it was really good. The kids loved it. And there's just nothing more satisfying to me than after my kids eat cornbread and soup and they go, wow, mom, that was so good. Um, that's just very satisfying to me. Chocolate gravy actually had chocolate in it. Straight well, over. Um, biscuits. Yes, I serve it on biscuits and it kind of looks like pudding, but you make it like a gravy. You still use bacon grease, but you put cocoa and sugar in it along with your flour. Sounds good. It's very good. You should try it. It's yeah. really good. I grew up with sausage gravy and red eye gravy. Yeah, I don't do red eye gravy. Now my husband will he will put red eye on my white gravy just to kind of make his own. He really likes it, but um, I don't know how to make that one. And coffee, use coffee. Oh, I didn't my know that. My grandmother would use it. Use coffee to, to do really? red eye gravy. Put it, pour it into your ribbon strippings. Oh, oh really? I had no idea. I'll have to look that up somewhere. You know, that's good on biscuits too. Oh, <laughs> yummy. Some of my Tennessee coming out here. There so. we go. That's, That's right. right. Yeah, I love sausage gravy. Absolutely. Did you have to buy a new wardrobe when you started? I did. Style? You know, that was very challenging for me. And, and, of course, I didn't have the money to do that. And so I'm very grateful. I had five friends that gave me clothes. Mm -hmm. I had five different women. One was my sister-in-law. But I had five women give me clothes. And I was so grateful. That got me through my first legislative session because we were depleted 
financially, I was exhausted, and, and I don't like to shop. That's the weird thing about me. I'm not a shopper, and I'm very fortunate. I have a sister-in-law who loves to shop. And um, my brother doesn't like for her to shop all the time, so this gives her a great reason to go shopping. But um, she does a lot of shopping, She pick, and she's a great sell shopper. So she picks things up for me. But um, those five friends, I'll tell you, I would not have made it because my, you know, being a teaching at the University of Oklahoma, I taught at Sooner Flight Academy. We wear flight uniforms. I was teaching math and science to fourth graders. Um, we wear our flight uniform because we're talking about NASA and talking about flight and aerospace. And um, so we just wore jeans or shorts under the flight uniform. So, yeah, that was after I won. That was my next step. My mom said, oh, you have to buy some clothes. And then I found out there was a dress code to be on the house floor for women. So, for women yes. Yeah. And uh, so I thought I didn't have any clothes like that. And, and uh, you know, our church where we go is a you know, small country church. And, you know, even at church, I mean, you don't have to dress up. And uh, so, yeah, I definitely had to had to do some shopping. But then after I had all my friends give me clothes, you know, after about a year or so, they thought, okay, Lisa, now you're going to have to do this on your own. <laughs> I thought, I don't know how to do that. So Representative Denny has helped me uh, quite a bit. I, I just, frankly, that was not important to me. Um, jeans and a sweatshirt and a pair of boots and a good pair of running shoes. I figured that's all you need. Um, I understand it has to be warm clothes. It has to be warm clothes. The house floor is, is chilly. And then a lot of the men like to turn the fans on. And, um, but yeah, we've taken blankets down there. and yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I definitely had to change my wardrobe. And then where do you sit in the chain? Uh, right now, house. I sit about midway back on, um, I guess, more, kind of the middle, really. A little bit. I guess I'm right at the center line on the right of that center line about halfway back. And they pretty much do it by when you're elected. Okay. Um, as you become a junior, sophomore, senior, then you slowly move up to the front. I kind of like sitting in the back myself. Some more of action. Yes, yes, definitely. And and plus you can walk out the back door and run and get you a cup of ice or a glass of water and not have to make a big scene, walk in front of everybody, so. When you were a freshman, how many other women came in with you? Let's well, see, women that came in with me, Lee Denny, Ann Cooney, Marion Cooksey, Sally Kern. Sue Tibbs was already here. Pam Peterson was already here. I, I think in four or five, I haven't left anybody out. Yeah, there weren't very many of us. Um, that came in. Um, Odelia Dank was already here, but certainly um, more women than has okay. been. Yes. There's not 10 currently, if I had it correctly. And we, uh, Oklahoma has typically been around the 47th in the nation on women holding elected positions. I think we went down to maybe 46, 46.5. We still have a ways to go, um, but we're improving. Well, they're, they're lucky to have you here. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, if nothing else, that's all I have. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yes, it's been a pleasure.